Today, I'm going to put three thinking models into a battle. Now, there's a whole load of other thinking models out there, but these three are probably the most commonly used. In today's video, I'm going to be putting these into a test to see how they can benefit all of us. So each model, I'll talk about what each model is, how they help with pattern recognition, and the actionable techniques you can take to benefit from them. Let the battle commence. We start things off with the divergent minds. This is where all of our brainstorming happens. This is where the ideas start coming out of the blue and they get brought out into broad daylight. It's about being open-minded, expanding your curiosities, endless idea generation. And speaking of idea generation, productivity expert Forte, who's best known for his book Building a Second Brain, explains divergence quite well. The purpose of divergence is to generate new ideas, so the process is necessarily spontaneous, chaotic, and messy. You can't fully plan or organize what you're doing in divergence mode, and you shouldn't try. This is the time to... When I started this YouTube channel, one of my friends at work recommended me this YouTube video called Divergent Minds from the series Mind Field. And in this episode, Michael Stevens explores the minds of some very extraordinary people who are not really like us, particularly those on the autistic spectrum. And he looked at one very talented blind autistic pianist named Derek Paravicini, and he sort of explored how he was able to do the things that no one else could. Michael even played the theme tune Minefield to Derek who had never heard it before and he asked her to play him this theme and Derek just got it almost instantly and played it back to him. I love that the biggest takeaway from this episode is that people like Derek who have these like insane abilities no matter how talented you are or if you're a savant or not the human mind can really expand to so much of what it's capable of outside of the common limiting norm that we all seem to succumb to and then going back to this benefit of idea generation no matter what idea you bring to the table it always has a part to play no matter how weird or wonderful it is, there's always a potential value that it can bring. So how does this help with pattern recognition? Well, first off, it challenges the assumptions from the common norm. Use Derek as inspiration. How he's able to hear things that no one could hear of. It's actually reminded me from this book called Peak by Anders Ericsson, and he actually found out that the perfect pitch that Derek actually required can actually be self-taught. Hearing that anyone can learn it, even like people can use their ears to distinguish what notes are being played. It's just amazing like how how much our human mind is capable of doing something like that. And when you can expand yourself beyond what's possible, you're essentially bringing one small or big idea into a world and seeing how much it can play a role into any solution that's good for. You ask more questions. Questions are the answer. This is a great lesson I learned from Jim Quick, who is a brain coach and he taught like so many CEOs, he told many entrepreneurs on how to use the power of your brain to learn more, read faster and remember almost anything. And one of his hacks when it comes to reading and getting better comprehension is asking more questions, asking dominant questions. Because when you ask more questions, you open up to possibilities. You open up to various answers, various interpretations of what you're trying to find. And thirdly, you develop a scientist mindset. Being divergent, you are basically a scientist. You're experimenting with so many ideas. Music is a science. Again, from what Derek is doing, he's experimenting with his music. And when you experiment with so many things, you find so much trial and error. And particularly when it comes to failure, can actually be one of the best teachers to have. If you want to think more divergent, reframe your problem. See the problem through the lens of its factors. See what other factors link into this problem and try to sort of see it from their angle. If I were to give an example of this, say for instance you're trying to reduce the waiting times of a theme park ride. 
typically one of the first solutions is to install more rides. Now obviously there's nothing wrong with that, it'll actually do make an impact in reducing waiting times, but there comes a cost to that. Whereas if you actually see it from the other factors that aren't really taken into account, one of the factors would be to increase the queue experience. So looking in the lens of like adding fun to the queue like adding in clowns, like some fun music or some animations going on or people telling jokes as they wait for their turn to go on that roller coaster ride. So you see what you're doing there, you're seeing in from a different lens and you're expanding yourself to possibilities in order to achieve that same outcome. All right, that was a strong contender, divergent thinking. Let's move on to the next one. It's all about simplification, filtering things down into one solution grouped together. So what is it all about? It's all about finding the root of the problem. You're finding that one thing that drives it all. And going back to our friend, Tiago Forte, he describes convergence as forcing us to eliminate options, make trade-offs, and decide what is truly essential. It is about narrowing the possibility so that you can make forward progress and end up with a final result. This is where the power of constraints come in, the power of your limits. You're looking in at the information you've gathered and you're shaving off all the unnecessary information down to one solution that is almost completely relevant to what you're looking for. So how does this help with pattern recognition? First off, there is logical reasoning. You identify your connections based on the evidence given to you. The solution all categorized in one little bubble, prediction. Pattern recognition has a lot to do with prediction. And when you analyze past observations and recognize recurring elements, we can infer potential outcomes and trends. When you're trying to find the one solution, you're looking at what's been going on with your data or the patterns of the information that you've gathered and what's the commonality you've been deciphering from all this. So if there are some actionable techniques, I would say adopt this kind of mindset, the Sherlock mindset. In summary, discombobulate. <laughs> Going back into categorization, you're finding what's similar between those connections and find the subtlest of patterns between these information that create this one big solution. Convergence is all about strategizing. You strategize by playing puzzles, strategy games. In fact, you could try this one out, one of my favorite games, Marvel Contest of Champions, which has like a whole roster of Marvel characters. And what I love about this is that each one has its have their own unique abilities and their own playstyle mechanics and some of them have such unique abilities that can be used on specific champions using the knowledge of what you've gathered about these characters and, and how they work you can gather this information together and filtering them down into one strategy that gives it the big picture on how to combat the opponent and finally seeking diverse perspectives one misconception about convergent thinking is that it sounds to be quite narrow-minded and is completely not the case. It acknowledges the value of these many different perspectives, but convergent thinking takes in the connections of the perspectives that you've gathered. Now that we have our two contenders, some people might say that this battle ends here. However, there is one more contender which I think is quite an underrated one and doesn't really get talked about that often, and here it is. Now, immersion thinking is an interesting one. When you have ideas together, emergent thinking opens the possibility that any idea can be connected with one another. This is known as non-linear connections. Some of you might be familiar with the work of Justin Sung, who's a learning coach, very popular on YouTube for debunking the overly glorified active recall and spaced repetition, not endorsing that they're bad and bad in of itself. And what he teaches is that most of the time when we are studying, we focus too much on the details 
in a linear sequence going from A to B to C whenever we're studying a topic. This is particularly like when it comes to a textbook. For instance, when you're studying from a textbook. But what he proposes with non-linear note-taking is that when you learn an, a piece of information and another piece of information, you're sort of connecting between the two. You're sort of making a mind map of, of what you've just learned. Some note-taking apps can harness the power of these non-linear note-taking. For instance, Obsidian or Rome Research that have these like something called bi-directional linking. This means that one note contains a link to another note that you can just access easily. And the cool thing about these apps is that they visually show these connections like in a very stylish map. But personally, I like to use the app Notion. Notion also has backlinking features, but unfortunately, it doesn't have the visual map that Obsidian and Rome has. And hopefully, if they can, if they can, if they can, if you could please, please put this map, put this map onto Notion, I would be the happiest person there is out there. So how does this help with pattern recognition? Well, aside from all the connections, all the connections here, you're unveiling hidden patterns. You're considering the interactions between the elements and the ideas. And it may help uncover higher level structures and behaviors that may arise. Like I said in the beginning, that these ideas have potential to connect with one another. And because of this, this creates uncertainty. But you're using uncertainty to your advantage. This is how systems work. Systems work with connections and interconnections. And sometimes what they output could be something very surprising. And by harnessing the power of uncertainty, you become more adaptable to it. So that when something unexpected comes in, you try to find the meaning behind it and how does it play a role and how you can use it to your own benefit. So with this mind in place, Let's go through some actionable techniques that you can use. First off, map it out. Use your mind maps. This is what Justin Sung uses to visualize his patterns and the information that you've gathered for your studying. Once you have a pattern, experiment with it. Be open to challenge your own assumptions and an understanding if the evidence actually supports this pattern that you've just discovered. And finally, stay curious and keep learning. Developments and fields are growing as we speak. And if you keep up to date with this, then you find out how the new information connects with your prior knowledge and see if anything needs to be modified or updated for extra clarity. And here we go. That concludes our battle. Now, the question is, who can be the winner of this battle? And the winner is... All of them. Each thinking model is powerful in of itself. But when you combine these three together, they become the essence of create. If you use these three mindsets together and you've been saying to yourself that you're not creative, you might feel that the limiting belief may not hold true anymore. I've actually had this limiting belief because I came from a science background. I did a lot of maths, did a lot of science, did a lot of everything factual. I didn't, I didn't care about stories. I didn't care about art or creativity or any kind of crap like that and then since having having these mindsets by reading these like insane amount of books or watching these productivity youtube videos and blog posts yada 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 i found out that what i thought to not be creative actually proved me wrong i couldn't comprehend like how much ideas i was generating no matter how small how insignificant i could perceive them to be i think when you come from a place like school or university or work you tend to be quite risk averse when it comes to to generating ideas because you want them to have a really good contribution and you're trying to find in what's like what's the best solution but I'm finding out by using these three thinking models together, I've just found out that like opening yourself to like any idea, any capability that you have, I just couldn't think it was possible and, and now it's actually come true. And I just hope that you can use these three thinking models to your advantage and to help you become a more smarter thinker. And also generally the reason why I decide not to go for one winner is because when you think about mental models, you don't want to overgeneralize. You don't want to be over-reliant on just one model and discard the others. You want to use models in synergy. You want to use them together to create your healthy perspective of life. And if there is one thing to take away from this video, it is that one. 
to not be over reliant on just one model and gather your toolkit of mental models and apply them to the situations they're best suited for. As always, thank you so much for watching this video. If you, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and you might want to check out this video right here where I talk a lot more about mental models and how they change my life and how they can change yours too. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.